We continue our study in Timothy. We are in 1 Timothy. When we stopped, we're up to chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, we'll read uh, 12 verses. First Timothy 6, 1. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have always taught us to include the reading aloud of your word as we gather in your presence. We are thankful for opportunities to sing to you and about you. We are thankful for opportunities to share our hearts and to hear your reply. Lord, we're thankful for the fellowship that we experience in one another as we come together in your presence. And Lord, we're very thankful for the gift of your word and how you speak to us through your word. Lord, you do all things well. We sure need to hear from you, Lord, as we're considering this particular passage, what is on your heart? Holy Spirit, we ask that you would explain these verses in a way that we can grasp. You will give us strength, courage, and power to be able to put them into practice in our generation. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Well, we're getting toward the end of uh, several chapters of instruction. Uh, there, have, there has just been, you know, uh, g uh, instruction after instruction after instruction, subject changes, but it's all about, you know, how are we the church? Uh, how do we conduct ourselves as the body of Christ? Why are we here? What are local congregations uh, uh, established for? And so we're getting, getting close to kind of wrapping things up here. So let's uh, keep going. And we have to just stop in the middle of thought sometimes as our time runs out. So it moves on now on what kind of employees we should be, whether we are bond or whether we are free. Back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. 50% of those who were in the Roman Empire were not free at the time that this was written. They were bond servants. 
In other words, uh, they were slaves. Not always the way you think of as slaves. Most folks consider slaves only to do manual labor or the most menial of jobs, but that's not the case, certainly in the Roman Empire. Uh, there were those who were slaves who were not free, who were highly educated. Uh, there were those uh, who uh, were actually hired or, or they were kept literally to train the children to raise the next generation. Uh, there were those who, who were bought for their uh, abilities to keep the books and to run a business. Uh, there were those who were good in construction uh, areas. There, there were all sorts of different skills. But the sad truth was that half of the people in the Roman Empire were not free. And so the gospel goes forth, and it goes forth to those who are free and those who are servants, those who are bond servants, those who are slaves, those who are under the yoke. And you know, people get saved. Some folks who were free, they got saved. Some folks who were enslaved, they got saved. All of a sudden, they're part of the same congregation. You know, some rich folks got saved and some poor folks got saved. Uh, some folks who were very uh, athletic got saved, and some folks who couldn't walk across the room got saved. There were those who, uh, who were very energetic and perky and, and just always up in life and those who were down in the doldrum. You know, we God saves all sorts of folks, doesn't he? And all of a sudden we come together. We haven't been together before we come to Christ. We were all staying in our assigned places. But then we come to Christ and Jesus says, whosoever will may come. I'm gathering my flock. Come together and draw close to me. And you may be sitting next to somebody who's, man, that, that guy's my banker. Or sitting next to someone, hey, that's, that's the mayor of the town. Or, oh, I know that fella. He digs ditches down around the corner. Or, oh, I know that one. For years, he was the one that was passed out drunk on the corner. And all of a sudden, they come to Christ. And we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. And the old walls go down. And Jesus gathers us together. And where before we didn't really know how to relate to one another, now we are actually brothers and sisters in Christ. And so God begins to do a work. Instead of pulling apart, how do we pull together? What we hold in common is faith in Christ. We've been born again. He has uh, convicted us of our sin, led us in repentance, We've cried out for mercy, turned our lives over to him. He has forgiven our sins, granted us eternal life, lives within us by his Holy Spirit. Now we are a part of his church. We are a part of the work. We're part of this, this kingdom of light. We are a part of the move of God in our generation. And we have to learn how to pull together. And it takes all those who are redeemed, those who are the redeemed of the Lord, to be able to reach the their city for Christ. So what we hold in common here is we've been born again in Jesus. We have followed the Lord in water baptism. We willingly take the scriptures as our guide. We are depending upon the Holy Spirit to manifest the life of Jesus in and through us every day. When we come together in a place like this, we expect Jesus to show up. We expect the Lord to manifest his presence. We ask him to speak and so we open our ears so we can hear what he says. We are considering his counsel. This is his word. It's his way to live. It may be in line with the way you were raised, or it may be very different than the way you were raised. Everything we have read, you may see, you may check it off. Yep, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, or, oh, no. You realize you're still a work in progress and got a way to go. You know what Jesus liked a long time ago, he still likes today. What he didn't like a long time ago, he doesn't like today. So we are now deliberately turning our back on the things of the world and the standards of the world. We open our heart, we look deep into the Lord's face and say, Lord, what are your standards? What is your will? What is the desire of your heart? What am I supposed to be doing today? What would bring a smile to your face this coming week? What do you desire of us as a group that has gathered together? Maybe you had a rough week. I sure hope you got to be here last Sunday if you had a rough week, because it was last Sunday that God 
took care of last week. You know, it's this Sunday that God's going to take care of this coming week. Last week's over with. So starting today, it's the beginning of the week. God is preparing you to be fruitful and effective in his service, no matter what circumstances you run into. And because there are many things that we may encounter, God covers a lot of ground in his scriptures. There's a lot of ground just in First and Second Timothy. And so we're getting close to the end of First Timothy. Here we run into what happens. Uh, how do you work for the Lord? Should you be a different kind of employee after you get saved than before you got saved? So God's emphasizing heart attitude. What should be the correct heart attitude toward the boss? Now, if you have an honest job, an honorable job, serve the Lord. If your old job is not honorable, it is not godly, you're going to have to get a new job in Jesus. If your old job was robbing banks, folks, you're going to have to change your work. If your old job was stealing horses, you're, you know, come from a long line of horse thieves, you're going to have to change. Okay, there are, there are some things that are not honorable before God. There's no way you can serve Jesus in those occupations. But if you have an honorable job, then you want to make sure you have the right heart attitude as you accomplish that job. And God tells us how we should, rate, uh, we should relate to our employer, even if we were servants, bond servants, even if we were owned, bought, sold, and, and traded. What, should, what is the proper attitude to have? The first attitude we adopt when it comes to employment is we understand that ultimately we work for Jesus, that Jesus is our ultimate boss. And the way we determine on how, uh, what we can do and what we can't do is how does it relate to what Jesus says to do? If most of what your boss tells you to do lines up with what Jesus says, then you can do so heartily. Even if you don't like it, you can still do so. And you can treat that boss with respect. But if something is required that is contrary to your faith, it is contrary to what you know is right in Jesus, then with all respect you have to decline. In other words, if you're supposed to, to cheat on something, or if you're supposed to lie to a customer, if you're supposed to, you can't do that. You understand there's certain things we can't do that it would grieve the Holy Spirit. So most things, you know, generally we can do. Every now and then, if there is something that does not line up, you'll have to respectfully decline. And we'll just have to leave the results of that in God's hands. Sometimes an employer will understand, sometimes they don't understand. The same struggles you go through in employment, that's what these folks were going through. And like I said, for a large large portion of them, they were not free folks. Uh, they were enslaved folks. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. So evidently it is possible to witness on the job that you not only uh, witness uh, to one another and share the good news of Jesus when we gather in God's presence, but that you are on that job as an ambassador for Christ, as a witness for the Lord. It says, And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. There, there were those who were coming to Christ who uh, owned servants. They owned slaves. And it says, if you found, if you thought, well, uh, I don't have to serve them the way I serve somebody else because this is a brother in the Lord. He'll understand. Uh, I don't have to be there on time. Or I don't have to keep my word. Or I don't have to uh, have good manners. And he'll understand because this boss uh, is a brother in the Lord. It says never fall into that kind of attitude. Never fall into that. You do what is right because it's the right thing to do. Ultimately, you are working for Jesus whether your boss knows the Lord or he does not know the Lord. 
uh, this, this command, teach and exhort these things, actually goes back several chapters. Not just this little bit that we, we stopped here. All those things we've been studying the last few weeks. All of those different things. And there's no way to go back over that. But it's not just this little short one. But you go back to the last few chapters. And it says, make sure you include in your teaching, as folks are coming to Christ, these various attitudes. There's certain things there about family. There's certain things there about employment. There's certain things in relationship to government. There's certain teachings about prayer. There's certain teachings uh, about uh, giving your word. There's certain teachings... Uh, uh, just uh, you know, about justice. There, all those different things that we went over. That's what this reference is. Teach and exhort these things. Okay, not just what we've just looked, but what we've gone over for several weeks. He says, Timothy, don't leave any area of life out. These areas need to be included. Don't assume that folks who get saved know how to do these things. Make sure you include them. If they know how they should act, if they know how they should treat their parents, or if parents know how they should raise kids, you know, don't, don't leave it out. Teach it. There's going to be some that do not know. There are some who will not mind being reminded. When it comes to good morals and just uh, good manners, it says don't leave that out. There are some who know those things, uh, but there are some who don't. There are some who will have never heard. So make sure when it's time, when you get to those passages in all Scripture, you include the whole counsel of God, both the glories and the sufferings of Christ, what people like to hear, what they don't like to hear, what they say, Amen! And the others, they say, Oh me, and they leave. Okay, it's the whole counsel, that which uh, God wants His people to know. Referring back to this long list of things that we've been studying the last few weeks, it says in verse 3, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, in other words, living, living right, uh, living godly, living the Jesus way. We know how to live wicked. We know how to live sinful. And the church has to deal with every single problem that the world has. Everything you hear about on the news, everything that's going on in the world, the church will have to deal with. Why? Where do we get our recruits? Our recruits come from the same place we came from, from the world. Lost in darkness, dead in trespasses and sins. You start off as a babe. Babes don't know much. They need to be taught. They need to be raised. They need to, make, they need to grow strong in the things of the Lord. So there is no way that you can tiptoe around any particular thing. Whenever the scriptures bring it up, meet it head on. The best way to, to, to get through that storm is to literally go right through the middle of it. Don't try and tiptoe around the storms of the world. I mean, take them on head on. Speak the truth in love. It says, for those who don't look at it that way in, in, in life, and for those who want to try and look for some wiggle room when it comes to the standards of God, it says, be very careful. Be very careful. Uh, watch out. It says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself." You know, there are some folks who are, quote, into godliness. They use the name of God to make a buck. They use the name of Jesus to make a buck. And that is not the teaching of Scripture. That's not what things are all about. Judas Iscariot fell into that. Judas Iscariot knew how to handle uh, wealth, and he had actually been voted the treasurer of the group, which meant you, you, you never deliberately 
uh, set aside somebody you know to be a crook to, to be your treasurer. You believe him to be a man who is honest uh, and one who is trustworthy. But you know, there were, there were things in his heart. There was covetousness in Judas Iscariot's heart, which kept him from coming to have a true relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's one of the very sad stories. You know, Jesus said, Have not I called twelve of you, and one of you is a devil. It did not surprise Jesus that Judas Iscariot was never saved, but it sure surprised the rest of the group. Jesus had everything under control, but there were folks who were shocked because they looked on the outward appearance and God always looks upon the heart. It says, if there are those who try and turn uh, godliness and using the name of Jesus or using the name of God into a money-making proposition, withdraw from those. Do not be a part of those ministries. Do not be a part of that work. That is not the goal to use God's name to make yourself rich. Now, here's the flip side. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. To know Christ and to be led by Christ and to be content in the calling that's on your life and the place that God has assigned you is great gain. Uh, that is worth more than all sorts of money that is in the bank. You know, the disciples, as we study them, they constantly kept getting into this, who's number one? Uh, if you look all through the ministry of Christ for over three years, there were times he would have to stop because they would debate among themselves, uh, who's the greatest? Who's the boss? Who's number one? It goes all the way to the, the, to the last night. I mean, all the way to the time of the, the Lord's Supper. Let, let, let me just show you. Back in, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus says this. In Luke 22, and uh, you have uh, the, the Passover that takes place, and they're going to have uh, the Lord, what we call the Lord's Supper. But that evening, Jesus says this, Luke 22, verse 24. Luke 22, 24 says, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table, yet I am among you as the one who serves. They were constantly struggling with this until God just settled that, and it really took the coming of the Holy Spirit to just give them that assurance and that view, and they, did, they no longer had that competition among themselves. But they wanted to look at things in a worldly way. Now, God is not against you getting ahead, and God is not against you being ambitious and desiring to accomplish your best. He's not against those things at all. But you must play by His rules. You cannot bring the rules of the world into the church and expect God to honor it. He will not. God will share His glory with no man. And Jesus does things differently than the world does things. God has among his people uh, those who are millionaires. And God has among his people those who aren't really sure where tomorrow's rent is coming from. Uh, in each group, you'll find those who love the Lord with all of their heart. God has those that would be classified as poor in his service, and God has those who are classified as rich in his service. What's important to God is what is your heart condition? Are you content? Are you at peace? Now, when God talks about being at peace, he means to be at peace with God, peace with your circumstances, peace with yourself. Okay, when God's speaking of peace, he talks about being at peace with God, peace with your circumstances, and peace with yourself. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. 
to be born again in Jesus, to be filled with the Spirit of God, you are actually one of God's redeemed. Heaven is your home. Boy, you are, you are godly. You are acceptable in God's sight by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Godliness with contentment is great gain. There are those who are poor who are never content. There are those who are rich who are never content. I can say it the other way. There are those who are poor who are very content and those who are rich who are very content. It is the heart attitude that means so much to God. And so there is a warning. We can look in Paul's testimony. If we go to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, as Paul was saying his thank yous to the brothers and sisters at Philippi, he had received a large love offering, support offering from Epaphroditus uh, who had carried that to him. And here's what he says in Philippians 4, beginning at verse 8. He says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Verse 10, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As Paul was saying his thank yous, and he specifically wanted them to know, I appreciate the money, the funds that you sent to me from Epaphroditus. And if you read all of this letter, you are familiar, the church at Philippi always uh, supported Paul when others didn't. And they did that until they lost him basically in the jail system. Remember, there's a few years he's jailed in Sincrae. And they didn't know where he was, and they didn't know how to get funds to him. And then as he was released, and well, he wasn't released, but he was moved in, in the prison system, they came to discover where he was. And so he says, I thank you. He says, I, I just appreciate this. I do not take it for granted what you have done. But he says, if, if I receive offerings or if I don't, if I'm supported, if I'm not, he says, I've learned to be content. If I have absolutely nothing, I have the Lord and all that heaven has and, and a whole eternity full of God's blessings. If I have much that I am managing at that time for the sake of Christ, that's fine. He says, if the, if the church puts me up uh, in a very wealthy person's house, and it, boy, it's, it, I have the, the finest bed, and I'm eating the best food, and I've got folks who, who are there to assist, he says, I've learned to be content. If I have to sleep on the side of the road, or if I've been in jail, and they haven't even brought me a change of clothes, I have learned to be content. I have learned to be at peace with God. Peace with God, peace with my circumstances, peace with myself. He says, boy, this is so much more than, than having millions and millions of dollars. He says, this is available for everyone, no matter what their educational background, no matter what their bank account amount is, no matter what they have experienced, they can know this peace that passes understanding. Here, as we continue, I'm going back into 1 Timothy now. We stopped at 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. It says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. 
But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. You know, and to the church in Colossians, as there was a warning as to what they needed to avoid, one of the things that Paul mentions in that Colossians 3, about verse 5, is that they need to, to avoid covetousness, which is idolatry, is his terminology. He says, beware of covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, we know it's wrong to create a false god and to bow down and to worship and to spend your time and your resources in promoting a false god, a false religion. We know that this is wrong. He says that covetousness is as idolatry. That really gets our attention. Covetousness and immorality are big hurdles in the city of El Paso for the body of Christ. Covetousness and immorality uh, rob many believers of their strength and their power in Jesus Christ. And there is no need to be in bondage because Christ would desire to set you free from covetousness and immorality that you walk and serve God with a pure heart and with clean hands. Covetousness is desiring things. If you fall into covetousness, you'll never have enough. The warning is if you want to be rich, if your desire, if your goal in life is to be rich, you have picked out a hard road and you're going to pierce yourself through with many sorrows. If God has chosen for you to be rich and to manage great wealth, and if you can be content in Him, then you will be a blessing to many people. Remember, God has his rich folks. God has his Abrahams. Abraham was a millionaire before he got saved and he even got wealthier after he got saved. Precious metals and livestock, it says, is how he made his, uh, his, his money. There were over 2,000 people that depended upon him. He had to get it right or those folks weren't going to be eating. And those were his employees and those family members who depended upon his wisdom. He was a good boss. Lydia in the New Testament uh, was, was very wealthy because she sold a product that only 1% of the population could afford. She sold a product that only the elite, only those in power, only those with great wealth. She was a seller of purple. The vast majority of people could not afford her product. She traveled internationally to sell her product. But in Philippi, she came to know the Lord. She was the first convert in Europe. She led all of her employees to Christ. She opened her home and the church was always welcome to meet in her home. She uh, was there to take care of folks and to be a blessing to them and the missionaries as they went through. She invited Paul and his missionary team. He says, if you she said, if you believe that I really am saved, would you come and stay in my house? In other words, don't hold against me that, that I'm rich and that I'm wealthy. I am, I am born again in Jesus. I understand that all that I have belongs to him. This wealth is now used to further his kingdom. And that's what she did. She used that. God has his Abrahams and has his Lydia's they serve as good examples God is not against you having wealth but he's against wealth having you he's not against you having money but he's against money having you our our whole advertising system is based upon covetousness and I've heard nothing but covetousness for weeks with the lottery you understand the whole system is based upon a sin before God. The whole system is based upon idolatry and there are Christians who participate and who talk about it. And folks, what are you going to do when you win your billion? Well, I'm not going to win the billion because I'm not about to waste a buck or two bucks or whatever, you know, you want to spend on that. Do you understand God speaks harshly against covetousness of which lottery is, is such a big example. It sneaks up on us quick, doesn't it? Covetousness really sneaks up on us in our culture because uh, it's more and more faster and faster. More and more faster and faster. Oh, you need one of these. Okay, got one of those. You need the new improved model. You got last year's model. Okay, well, you don't need just one model. You got a green one. You need a red one. You know, it's covetousness, isn't it? 
It's not based upon needs. It's not based upon service. It's just based upon more and more, faster and faster. We can get, we can get sucked into it and not even realize what's happening until we screen things through Scripture. We have to be careful. There are those who, for riches' sake, will sell out their nation. For riches' sake, will turn their back on their families. For riches' sake, will drag their name through the mud and will no longer be a people of honor. For riches' sake, life becomes cheap. Why is there such a drug traffic and, and such a problem with drugs in the city of El Paso? There are those who are in bondage to covetousness, and if they can get hundreds of dollars because of passing on those drugs, they could care less who they kill. So what if that fentanyl kills those kids and kills those family members? I don't care. That is the height of covetousness. Do you understand? It's what drives it. If it were not for covetousness, it would not be there. But because of the money that can come through those drugs, life becomes cheap. They are those who have no honor. They have no heart. They have no patriotism because they've gone after riches. And the scripture warns us, you stay away from that. If you make riches your goal, you will pierce yourself through with many sorrows. Yeah, but I'm saved. I don't care if you're saved or not. If you make riches your goal, you will pierce yourself through with many sorrows. If God makes you rich, then you pray, Lord, help me to be a good steward. Help me to manage this wealth under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I am so glad that God has people like that in our culture. Those who know how to build wealth, how to manage wealth, how to run honest companies, how to hire hundreds of people, and how to give a man an honest job for an honest day's wage. This blesses the Lord. This is a good thing. We try and really support. I, it, we want the righteous to control the wealth. You don't want the wicked or the evil to be in control of the wealth, right? You want the righteous. But you watch, most of it is not controlled by the righteous. So there, you'll probably get to experience a little of each in a lifetime. You will have times that you, you really don't know how you're going to get out of the mess you got yourself into. But God gets you through, right? Other times, there may be other reasons that you may have, all of a sudden, you need to learn how to manage some wealth. And God knows how to do that. Make sure you manage your wealth and your wealth does not manage you. It says, Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Do you understand God has promised to meet our needs? It basically boils down to food, clothing, shelter, doesn't it? God loves to take care of your food needs, your clothing needs, your shelter needs, and he loves to give you a worthwhile assignment every day. I mean, the needs have been met. So much in our culture is blessing. So much is above and beyond meeting needs that we have to be careful that the, those things do not become more important than Jesus. If you have no time for Jesus because you're having to manage all this stuff. I have no time to gather with the church because i got to manage all this stuff. I have no time uh, for, for family or for friends because i got to manage all this stuff. Be very careful. Make sure that Jesus is first. Going on, it says, Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness or their covetousness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now that's about as straightforward as it can be said. And you have Paul having learned that lesson in his generation, passes it on to Timothy, who is told to train the people in that truth. And it's a truth for our generation, for every generation. This meets the test of scripture. This works in Vietnam. It works in China. It works in Australia. This works in anywhere in the United States and Mexico. This is the very word of God. It is active all over the earth. Many do not have the temptation that we have here when it comes to covetousness. They do not have access to the many things that are there. What do you want to have? If the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, what do you want to replace it with? 
<laughs> Give your love to Jesus. There's blessing there. Keep Jesus first. Love Jesus more than you love money. Keep Jesus first. You love Jesus more than you love family. You love Jesus more than you love self. You love Jesus more. Do you understand as followers of Christ, we love God more than we love men, and we fear God more than we fear men. Keep Jesus first, and all the rest of this will fall in place. Whether you get to manage a little wealth or a lot of wealth, keep Jesus first. And here's how it finishes. It says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Is that easy? No, it's referred to as a fight. It's not referred to as easy to live that way. It's referred to as a fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let's pray. Lord, we, our ears are open. You have brought up some things that maybe we've considered in the past, maybe we haven't, but Lord, you have our attention. We understand there are some things important to you in these last chapters of 1 Timothy on how we should live on a daily basis. Lord, some we are putting into practice and some we have ignored. Father, where we have put them into practice, all we can say is, you know exactly what you're talking about and your word works. Where we have ignored you, Lord, we ask for forgiveness and we ask for details. You know, how, how can we put your word into practice in a way that's pleasing in your sight? Lord, I ask that you would encourage these who have come. Lord, we need power if we're going to do what you say. We cannot plead ignorance, but Lord, we certainly need power by your Holy Spirit to live the way that you say we ought to. We need your help. We openly ask for it. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.